Hi there, you're listening to the Pursue Your Spark podcast. I'm your host and midlife warrior, Heike Yates. And on this show, we're talking about fitness, nutrition, and mindset strategies for women in midlife. Plus, our fierce guests on the show share their stories to help you reclaim your power to spark an authentic life. Well, hi there, it's Heike Yates, and welcome to another episode of the Pursue Your Spark podcast. Before we dive into today's episode, I want you to grab your free five spark lifestyle strategy guide for you, the woman in midlife, so you can start your fitness journey or tune up your fitness lifestyle so that you can feel energized, vibrant, healthy, fit, and confident. Yes, it's a free guide. It has simple action steps and worksheets for you to get going in your fitness, nutrition, and mindset lifestyle. So head on over. I will put a link in the show notes for you to grab this free guide. Today's guest is my very first Pilates guest. And when I asked Jillian to come on the show, she asked me just that. She says, Heike, am I your first Pilates guest? And I said, yes. And we both were super excited. Now, Jillian has been teaching Pilates for much longer than I have. I have been teaching Pilates for 20 years and she has going on 35. Initially, she started out being the best ballet dancer in the world. And she succeeded, but there was trouble along the way and she was diagnosed with scoliosis. And she found her new passion in Pilates. And not only do we talk about how, why and how Pilates is so good for any age and fitness level, we'll go down the Pilates path and the Pilates history and story. I could have talked to Jillian for hours wanting to know more about the famous people she has worked with in the path that she chose and trained with and learned from. I was just her sponge to her stories. And I know you will, just as I, be delighted to listen to today's interview with Jillian Hessel. So let's dive in and dive into the world of Pilates. Today's guest is Jillian Hessel. Jillian is a former ballerina and yogini and has been teaching Pilates since 1981. She's known for her concise verbal instruction and crystal clear imagery. Jillian is an international presenter at Pilates conferences throughout the world, and she's the author of Pilates Basics. Welcome to the show, Jillian. Thank you so much, Heike. It's um, really um, exciting for me because uh, I'm kind of a latecomer to Instagram and that's how we met. Yes. It's a whole new uh, social media forum for me and uh, very exciting to to, uh, learn about what you're doing with uh, Pursue Your Spark. Thank you. But I want to know if you get to pick one Pilates exercise, what would be your favorite? Short spinal massage. I like short spine. Yep. Yes. Yes. And the reason is that I have a double curvature of the spine, which is only worsened as I've aged despite Pilates. And that particular exercise with its cueing roll down through the spine, vertebra by vertebra, peel off from the spine, vertebra by vertebra, it just wakes up my spine. I feel like I get traction and length where I most need it, which anybody over 50, you know, it's the waistline. So <laughs> that's my favorite, but I think it was my favorite even when I was younger. Yeah. So how did, how did you get started with Pilates? Tell us about your journey. Uh, gosh, it's a long one. Um, I trained, I, I grew up near New York City and was very fortunate to have been scouted when I was at a ballet summer camp up in Western Massachusetts. It was called Fokine Ballet Camp. And Jacques Dumbois, who was a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet, came to do 
a guest stint teaching there when I was 13. And he paid a lot of attention to me. I had the body type with the long legs and um, long neck and um, kind of lean racehorse look that George Balanchine liked. So I got recruited for the School of American Ballet, which is the training ground for dancers in the New York City Ballet. And um, I studied for quite a number of years there, but I was already having problems with my feet and I was referred to a teacher named Zena Romet, who devised what we call floor bar technique. And it emphasized a lot of placement work. And of course, it was good for me with my feet problems. I, my back problems weren't quite detected yet. And um, in the end, because there was a disparity at uh, the School of American Ballet, uh, with the training between that and Zena Romets, which was very focused on proper body placement. And I mentioned that because, of course, Pilates is as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of like doing Pilates on the floor for dancers with particular attention to, of course, for ballet dancers turning out and strengthening the feet. But you can see a similarity there to Pilates. I feel like it was kind of my precursor. Anyway, I moved from School of American Ballet to a school called Harkness. And at the time, Rebecca Harkness was a, a big sponsor for um, ballet training. And um, I trained there for quite a number of years, finished high school early. And another principal dancer, former principal dancer from the New York City Ballet, came to the Harkness School and recruited for um, a company in Europe, actually in Geneva, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And I got drafted to join that company at age 18. So I moved to Geneva at age 18 with quite a number of other young girls. Patricia had this vision to form her corps de ballet with all of these young dancers that weren't weren't professionals yet. So she gave a big break to a bunch of us. Um, it was quite an experience for me at age 18 to move to Europe. This was in 1973. Um, I lived in Switzerland for three years and then I moved to Frankfurt, Germany. So I had a four year education when most kids are doing their four year uh, college work from age 18 to 22 I, I spent in Europe. That but must I, have been incredible. Yeah, it really was an amazing time for me. I, I had the opportunity to travel with the company. And of course, you know, being European, Heike, <laughs> um, arts are treated quite differently in Europe than they are here in the United States. It's considered a necessity to have um, culture there. So, you know, it, I had quite an introduction with a year-round job, paid vacation, cost of living increases, uh, bonuses, you know, um, health insurance. I yeah. um, was fortunate because I had a very bad fall um, in my first year in Geneva, and I really landed, like I call it the banana peel splat on my tailbone, oh. and I was frozen absolutely frozen, could not move, could barely breathe. And when I had the x-ray, there was the scoliosis. Yes. So I struggled with that. You know, uh, in Europe, they did have the, the health insurance, thank goodness, physical therapy, um, injections, of course, for the back spasms, uh, all kinds of medical attention. But what really happened was I moved back to the States and was dancing in New York and uh, a, a fellow dancer recommended that I try Pilates because I'd tried everything else. And uh, that was the beginning of my discovery of Pilates in 1981. And my first teacher was Kathy Grant. Kathy Grant is such or was such an amazing teacher. I was had the pleasure of taking some of her classes and studying a little bit with her. So you were fortunate to start with Kathy. What did she say? Well, Kathy was very methodical in her evaluation of me. And uh, we have this term in Pilates, which 
probably not all your listeners are familiar with, but you would be called posterior lateral breathing, where we are trying our best to spread the ribs uh, front side and back, like um, we, we say an accordion. Yeah. Yeah, rather than breathing vertically, we're breathing horizontally. And so, in other words, we don't want to hike the shoulders up to the ears. I want to take a big breath. So Kathy cued me to breathe posterior laterally. And first of all, I had no idea what she was talking about. But second of all, uh, because my rib cage had become so imbalanced with the scoliosis, when I took a large breath, I, I always used the um, metaphor that my rib cage shifted off like a typewriter carriage. You know, of course, we don't have typewriters anymore, but <laughs> if you can imagine one side of my ribs inflated hugely to the left and the right side didn't do much of anything. The, the muscles were kind of flaccid. And she, uh, figuratively at least, threw up her hands and said, well, I'm not putting you on any of the specialized Pilates equipment until you go home and learn to breathe evenly into both sides of your ribs. So that was pretty radical for me because I had a bit of an ego having been a professional dancer in Europe for four years and I had a, a job in New York dancing and I thought, well, I'm a movement person and I can do all the, you know, I walked into that studio and the equipment is so strange. Uh, anyone who has done Pilates will remember the first time they saw the equipment. It's like, what is this? But the, first the time dancers I were moving so beautifully and I thought, well, I can do that. Yes. But what I learned was the way I had learned to dance, unfortunately, was what I call monkey see, monkey do. In other words, the teacher would demo or a more advanced uh, um, student would demo and I would imitate, which works fine from the outside, but when you have a structural imbalance, it doesn't work because what had happened with all my years of dancing and pushing and forcing and working through the injuries was no one ever addressed my structural imbalance. And in fact, from the age of 18, when it was first diagnosed to the age of 26, when I first found Kathy, it had gotten worse, not better. And I was holding center with uh, just tension body tension, which worked okay in ballet because there wasn't a lot of spinal articulation. You know, uh, in particular, the Balanchine style was a lot of the legs going up high and so on. But I was really impeded from advancing as a professional dancer with my back pain. So you were still in pain at that point? Oh, I was in terrible pain by that point. If anything worse, I was really at the point when I went to Kathy where I couldn't sit in a car with a seatbelt on for more than 20 minutes without sciatica shooting down one leg. And I couldn't sit in a movie theater, uh, you know, but of course I was still dancing because that's what dancers do. They push on beyond. And I look back now and I think I probably didn't know what a mess I was because every dancer had bloody feet and pain. We're always pushing. Mm -hmm. But I do, I think in retrospect, I probably was in worse pain because of the structural imbalance than most of my colleagues. Yeah. But we were all pushing on beyond. That's what athletes do. That's what dancers do. And we didn't have the physical therapists and all the um, uh, modalities that we do now to cross train. So how long did it take you to get the breathing right and actually go back to Kathy and do something about your scoliosis? Well, Kathy made an exception for me. She um, came in and you have to know, Kathy lived in Brooklyn and her studio was in Midtown Manhattan at this very Tony department store at the time called Henry Vendell's. It's since closed, but it was right on West 57th Street near Fifth Avenue near all the very fancy boutiques and, and department stores. And so she had to take two different trains to get in from Brooklyn. And she told me that she would meet me 
before her studio opened, which was at 8 a.m., she would meet me at 7 or 7.30 in the morning to guide me. And so began, I went three times a week to her, and she really bent over backwards. And it wasn't just for me. She did this for so many dancers that wanted to dance and didn't have a lot of money. And she came up with what she called uh, in later years before the 100s, but it came from the root of all of us as dancers. Rarely did you arrive at a class just in time to take your place at the bar and begin with plies. You always got there early and did your warm ups. And she devised very specialized warm ups specifically for me. And um, I had to really go home and practice. And at one point, she told me, you know, you do well. I spend an hour, an hour and a half, two hours sometimes in the studio, and I would be more or less guided into alignment by her. And then I'd go off to dance class, and she would get very frustrated when I came back because I would go back to my old movement patterns in dance. So the most radical thing that she um, requested of me was I had to stop dancing for the entire summer and just work with her. Interesting, but that was your source of income. Well, at this point, my job had terminated and I was on, unlike in Europe, when you had a paid vacation, I was on uh, unemployment benefits. I see. So I was collecting unemployment, which was some money, and uh, seeing Kathy, pretty much. Um, my mother was very ill at the time as well, so I was doing a lot of caregiving. And it, it was a time, fortunately for me, to just spend that time with Kathy. And I always say she completely uh, took me apart and put me back together, and I had a whole new conception of how to move and how to align my body from the ground up, from the inside out, which was a total stark contrast to how I had had all my dance training. Yeah. So you moved from Kathy on to Corolla Trier. How did that work? Well, at the end of that summer, I trusted Kathy enough to stop dancing, and it really began to gel at that point what I needed to do from my body. And... Um, I, my unemployment benefits ran out. I think they were for three months and I was without a job. I had no dance job and no viable source of income. And it so happened that Corolla Trier, who was about 10 years older than Kathy and Ramana, who was also teaching at the time. And by the way, Kathy and Ramana had both worked at Corolla's studio, sort of graduates because Corolla was the very first teacher trained by Joseph Pilates who had his permission to open a studio. And she was literally cross town a couple of blocks on 7th Avenue and West 58th Street. So I went from 5th Avenue and 57th across town to Corolla on Kathy's recommendation. She said Corolla needed a teacher and I should go and interview and um, possibly have a job. Uh -huh. So it was with Kathy's blessing that I went over to Corolla. And um, it really was an amazing experience because Corolla interviewed me and accepted me as an apprentice at the time. And this was uh, also 1981 in the fall. I had gone to Kathy in the late spring, early summer and gotten that foundational work. And um, Corolla agreed to take me on as an apprentice teacher for four dollars an hour. Oh, <laughs> yes. And so began my time uh, working as an apprentice at uh, Corolla's four days a week, I believe it was, four mornings a week. And then I was training with Kathy in the afternoons. So I had this unique opportunity to train as a teacher with Corolla, but still work on my own personal workout and body issues with Kathy. And I was a bit of a liaison. Kathy would say, well, what are they doing over there? And, <laughs> I'd, um, and then uh, I would be confused because Ka uh, Corolla's worked at a much quicker pace in a kind of almost a circuit is what you would call it today, moving from one piece of equipment to another. And, uh, 
I would be confused because it was going so fast. And there weren't those methodical specialized warm-ups there. And um, so I would ask Kathy to help me break down what, what exactly what was going on <laughs> so that I could become a better teacher. But it was a very unique and wonderful situation. Did that combination inspire you to pursue Pilates as a profession? Not yet. I was only 26 years old. And what my real goal was, was to get my back healthy enough to uh, go back to dancing. And of course, in America, most dancers would know it's very rare to have a full-time year-round job as I had been spoiled working in Europe for four years. So you sort of get these gigs, you would call them, piecemeal, where you're working for three months and then maybe collecting unemployment and then the company has enough money to work for three months and then you collect unemployment. So I was very grateful to discover that Pilates was a second love and a second passion. And I had, of course, in the back of my mind that when I stopped performing, this might become a second career. But my primary goal at that time was to get my back healthy. However, at that time also, my mother was terminally ill and um, I was very grateful to have a job. And um, Corolla was such an inspiration. She really was kind of like my grandmother. And, um, you know, she'd yell at me in the studio and was very exacting and short tempered, but then she'd take me into the kitchen and make me a coffee and sit me down and really want to know what was going on in my life. She was extremely compassionate. Um, so it, it was a special time because I, I was working with both women and they were kind of replacing my mom in a way. Was your mom living in New York or somewhere else? She was in, uh, well, I had grown up in Tarrytown, New York, which those of you who know New York, it's um, a suburb straight north on the Hudson River, and it has its own uh, history because it was owned by the Dutch New York before the English. And so uh, we had uh, Washington Irving. I went to Sleepy Hollow High School, if you've heard of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. And... Uh, it was. I was lucky because it was only about a 45-minute express train ride into Manhattan. And so my mother was um, uh, in the home I had grown up in. I see. Yeah, so I, I was living in Manhattan, but I would go home and, you know, all of the family members were helping to care for her. It was a difficult time. When was there the transition when you moved out west? How did that take place? Well... There was an in-between where um, my mother did pass away in December of 1981. And uh, I had also uh, recovered enough with my spine to start uh, training at the Martha Graham School. And that was a delight because I had really had primarily ballet and flamenco training and some Ooh. jazz training, lyric jazz by a wonderful teacher who's also since passed on named Luigi. This was all at the Harkness School. But this was really my first introduction to modern dance. And I was taking classes at the Graham School. It was during the time that Martha Graham made her final comeback. She was 90 or older. And I did have the great good fortune to take some classes uh, with her, which was just amazing, having met and worked with Mr. Balanchine as well when I lived in Europe. Um, so I met these incredible dance luminaries. And uh, I did meet uh, Martha Graham in a group setting, uh, not one-to-one, -one, of course, but um, you can imagine that was a whole revelation, having opened up my spine thanks to Pilates, and in particular, stomach massage, I might add, which was my <laughs> second favorite exercise, because it really opened up my lumbar, and I think helped cure my sciatica, just opening up all that compression in the lower back with stomach massage. But... Um, I was really delighting in um, all these different styles of modern dance and picking up little gigs here and there with small modern dance groups. However, once my mother had passed, I had an opportunity to move first 
to Miami to work with a modern dance troupe down there. And uh, so I moved to Florida and got out of Manhattan. And um, that was kind of a renaissance for me, uh, just being in a, a wonderful, sunny climate with the beach and really quite a change. And that's where I really, um, it was scary to leave Kathy and Corolla, but I started teaching Pilates to the dancers down there as well. Interesting. And, um, yes. It, it, so, and there I met, um, a teacher who had studied with another first generation teacher who's since passed on named Robert Fitzgerald. So I was introduced to yet another, um, shall we say, limb of the tree. Um, if Pilates is the root, Mr. Pilates, there were all these limbs that grew of what we call first generation teachers. And um, so I learned another approach in particular to Pilates mat work from my teacher who had worked with uh, Robert Fitzgerald. And uh, that company didn't last long, it kind of folded. I had work up in Boston for a time, so I was going back and forth between Florida and Boston with part-time dance work. And in the end, I did move out to Los Angeles with one of my boyfriends. And when I got to LA, I started working at the Ron Fletcher studio for body contrology. Yeah. So yet another limb of the tree. And when I finally did meet Ron, because he was semi-retired and his um, two protégés, Diane Severino and Michael Podwell had taken over his big studio. I only met Ron sort of coming and going and in workshops later on, but it was like I met a kindred spirit that I'd had a past life with when I met Ron because I think of the, of the Graham work and how he had mated his work with Martha Graham when he was a young dancer with the Pilates work. And I might add also because Ron had been an alcoholic and went in the 12 step program he also had this kind of unapologetic spiritual approach with Pilates. And I just loved that. Uh -huh. um, resonating with his higher power and the lift that he gave dancers and non-dancers alike that, that exuberance with the added dimension of the spirituality, I just loved Ron. And I always tell teachers uh, or aspiring teachers that you just have to find a mentor that you want to sit at their feet and listen to them because Ron was like that. Very nice. I got the chance to meet Ron Fletcher a few times during the conferences and you're, you're absolutely right. He was a unique personality and very strong in yes. his teachings as well as in his opinions. Yes, he was extremely charismatic and having met uh, Martha Graham, I could see the root of the foundation of all his work because as all dancers, as I mentioned, have warm ups and uh, in Graham technique, you do begin the class on the floor. This is an interesting point of history. We had a tradition at the Graham School, whenever the teacher walked into the room, and of course it was Martha Graham who uh, initiated this, the sign of respect when the teacher walked into the room to begin the class was you stood up. And uh, you did not reseat yourself to begin the class until the teacher cued you to do so. And Ron brought that element of respect into the Pilates world. That's a very interesting tidbit. I had not heard that. Yes, we always stood up when Ron came in. And of course, then the, the, the story of Ron is you stood for a long time. <laughs> you stood a very particular way because he, he, he wanted you to know how to take the work into the vertical alignment. And we would stand and he would tell stories and you'd be dying. But uh, you did not sit until Ron cued you to sit. How funny. Now, this is such awesome. And I know we can talk for hours about 
the stories of Polaris, which I just love to hear, especially from you who've been so close to all those teachers. But you developed your own approach to Pilates called BEAM. Tell us more about the BEAM technique. Well, I was approached by a, a big company called Gaim International. That's spelled G, uh, G I A I M. And they, at the time, this was the um, very late 80s, early 90s, were producing a lot of, of course, it was VHS at the time, <laughs> videos for the <laughs> yoga world. And they have still, I believe, their superstar is Rodney Yee. And they decided they wanted to get their finger into the pie of the Pilates world. And so they approached me and it was quite flattering. I had by this time branched out here in Los Angeles and formed my own company. Uh, my company was called the Well-Tempered Workout, Inc. It still is, although I now use the Nomer Jillian Hesso Pilates. If you recall, Heike, there was a lawsuit. Yes. In, yes, and we were not allowed to use what I call the P word. I got the threatening letter and all of that. And so at the time, I was... Um, getting married and I needed to have a corporation to protect my business assets from my, uh, my uh, married life. And so I incorporated and I became the Well-Tempered Workout Incorporated, um, which I loved because I believe Pilates tempers your body like steel. And I also was pretty well-tempered as a teacher, having you know come through the ballet world with a lot of, uh, what shall we say, short-tempered and abusive teachers, I would be positive in my approach to teaching. So I decided Well-Tempered Workout was a, a good um, name for my company. But nevertheless, uh, much like the word Pilates, it doesn't really tell you anything about what the work is. And there was the very first book by Gail Eisen and Philip Friedman called Working Out the Pilates Way, which came up with six principles. These were not principles that Mr. Pilates himself came up with. You know, Mr. Pilates called his work body contrology. He did not name it after himself. Yeah. But the words body contrology never took off as a technique. And it became, oh, I'm going to Pilates. I'm seeing Pilates. Pilates for my workout and suddenly I'm doing Pilates, but it didn't really describe what Pilates was. So Gail Eisen and Philip Friedman came up with those six principles, centering, breathing, flowing movement. And um, I will stop there because the reason I came up with BEAM was I could never Remember all six principles. I, I would go, wait a minute, I'm missing one. What, what, what was it again? And so it came to me in a meditation, having been a baby boomer and grown up with Star Trek, Beam Me Up Scotty, that BEAM was a perfect acronym for how I teach Pilates, which was rooted in the very first thing that Kathy told me was, I'm not going to teach you anything else until you learn to breathe properly. So there's the B of beam, breathing. Mm -hmm. And if we breathe well, the body becomes energized. There's the E. And then we are aligned. And that's the A of beam. And M is move. So I used beam, again, keep in mind, I couldn't use the P word and I had to come up with something. So beam, a four letter word, is an acronym for breathe, energize, align, and move. And that became my uh, beam fundamentals, circling back to Gaim, they were very into not just shooting uh, video for DVDs or at the time, as I said, VHS um, in the early 90s, but they did these packages. So they wanted me to write a book, which became my book, which is 
uh, now in reprint as of 2017, Pilates Basics. So there was a package at the time in the early 90s with Pilates for Beginners was the video, Pilates Basics was the book, and furthermore, there were some props um, to help people access the work. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a smart move on their part to package it as a whole workout package with everything that you need to do it. Well, and keep in mind, this is the early 90s, really before the social media explosion. So you had Pilates on the East Coast and the West Coast and several of the large cities in between. But I had gotten all this press and people wanted to study with me, but there was no way to learn Pilates at home. So the idea with the book and the video together was you could get down on the floor with your video and if you were confused you could pause it freeze frame and reference the book which was laid out in the exact same way that the video was so geez i'm not too sure what the cross leg fall is um, from the video let me freeze frame it and go and take a look at the more in-depth in explanation in the book. Mm -hmm. and the book at the time was spiral bound so you could open it flat while you were on the mat and take a look at the in-depth explanations and the book I believe at the time was very unusual because on the left hand column it had the um, the beam cues what the breathing and and so on boom 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 and then on the right hand side it had poor form on purpose that was fun for me to shoot I was in poor <laughs> form on purpose doing common mistakes that people make so for instance in the breathing I would show the neck and the shoulders all hunched up and you know this is the way you don't want to breathe and then I would wrap a theraband around my rib cage to demonstrate that posterior lateral or accordion breathing and how you could do that at home without a teacher to really um, give yourself feedback you know why do you think Jillian that Pilates works for any age and fitness level well I believe that it works for any age and fitness level for a lot of reasons and it circles back to modern life being such a rush rush multitasking kind of a thing and if we really do start with those beam fundamentals as Kathy Grant cued me we're tuning into an awareness of how we're breathing and how we're using the lower abdominals to assist on the exhale, which in turn um, helps support the low back, which let's face it, um, there's lots of theories that uh, um, we were starting on all fours in evolution and that coming upright was both great, but also ultimately because of the pull of gravity as we age, standing vertical, we start to shrink, we start to lean over, we need um, our abdominals and our back muscles and our pelvic floor muscles to be very strong to resist that pull of gravity. And we can learn this at any age. You could go into an old folks home and give a chair routine with Pilates principles and help people strengthen their vertical posture in a seated position. Um, people in a wheelchair can do it. Uh, young children can do it. Um, so, you know, it's really wonderful because it brings body awareness with that breath control. And I believe if you are really in tune with your breathing, in flow, um, cueing in breath, out breath, and the movement as I learned it, you can't be thinking about your shopping list or the movie that you saw last night or picking up the kids. You are in the moment and it's like moving meditation and that's a gift to the world. Yeah, yeah. Everybody is multitasking and I just talked about this on social media too. It's like people are not focusing on the one thing only and making that a good, a purposeful exercise in this case. Yes, my phrase of choice is the purity of the form of the movement. And if you're really marrying 
that awareness of centering and breathing with the purity of the form. You don't need to do 100 reps, three to five, maximum 10, and you're in flow without a lot of talk. And that was one of Corolla's pet peeves, that there shouldn't be a lot of talk. Yeah. Yep. I couldn't agree more with Corolla. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has gone very far, and I find myself at fault as well, with so many cues that the body is unable to assimilate them all at the yes. same time. Yeah. Unable to, you know, to a certain extent, you just have to do it and it goes deeper because of the genius of the flow. The flow. Yeah. Now, Julian, some people say uh, Pilates is not functional. We lie down for most of the time. What's your take on this? Totally false. Um, I actually, um, I'm always getting re-educated. I'm, you know, been teaching since 1981. But as I described, I was trained as an apprentice and I didn't have the foundation of anatomy originally. I had to go back to school and uh, there was no Pilates certification back in the 80s. So I, when I moved to Los Angeles, I actually um, went to UCLA to a continuing educational program to become a certified health fitness professional is what they called it. But I had to study anatomy and exercise physiology and uh, kinesiology. And um, I actually learned Olympic weightlifting and business practice. It was a wonderful program. The point being your education never finishes. And um, I got a certification a couple of years ago through an institute called the Functional Aging Institute. And it really did get me thinking about this question of Pilates being done supine or prone or sidelining and not standing up. And it is totally not true. Uh, um, going back to Ron, of course, having you practice standing and working on all of the first generation teachers probably also because they were dancers, but I'm sure they got it from Joe Pilates. The importance of the feet are so profound. You know, all of that training of rolling through the foot, that's how we propel ourselves walking. Mm -hmm. And if you go to retirement homes and assisted living facilities, you see people widening their gait, shuffling rather than picking up their feet and rolling through. And what do we work on as Pilates teachers? Of course, reformer work, we're working through the feet and that's to prepare you to stand. And the more work that we do standing with the Wunde chair and the um, high chair, uh, pet name is the electric chair, as you know. Yeah. The, pedal, the pedal is a marvelous vertical training um, apparatus and used a lot of new props uh, in these days as well, the large fitness balls, but certainly um, the high barrel or the ladder barrel, there's a tremendous amount of work in the repertory that's done vertical. Yeah. And um, the way that Corolla taught you, for example, to mount and dismount the reformer looks very similar to how uh, an aerobics class with those um, boxes, you know, the, uh, the, the boxes where you step up and step down to raise your heart rate. She would drill us in the transitions between the exercises on mounting and dismounting the apparatus. Well, there you have stair climbing, which is another thing, getting up and out of a chair and sitting back down. Ron choreographed, and so did Corolla, the proper way to sit and um, rise from the apparatus. And I believe, again, these are elements that aren't necessarily taught in all the teacher training modalities uh, today. I know that the Fletcher program works on it, and certainly I teach it, but it gets kind of lost in the sauce. Yeah, it's very convoluted, I find. It's it's just do the big moves on the big machines and everybody comes in and talks about the reformer and that's all they know. And then you do footwork and they're like, well, well, are we done soon? I'm like, you haven't breathed. You haven't articulated. You're not anywhere near. Well, if you go back to Corolla and Ron, for example, you were taught 
as part of the routine how to mount and dismount the equipment and it was part of working the body and um we would watch clients if you cue them okay go over and pick up the box and put it on the reformer long box or short box however you're watching the body mechanics of the person as they're setting up and striking their equipment because what good is the work if they're doing it beautifully while they're lying supine but it isn't integrating into how they stand up and walk out of the studio it has to work and that was what kathy said to me i'm not going to teach you any of the work until you're using your body correctly so she caught me as a dancer you know you'll often stand i have it in my book in the posture section with cocked hip posture which is also a model stance you know it's uh, considered confrontational to stand on both feet and you know look straight on so a, a, a woman will be taught oh it's sexier to stand with one hip cocked and one knee bent and a hand on the hip and you know, one shoulder is higher and all of that and Kathy got me thinking about that so that I, I, I couldn't have my dancers uh, bag as a shoulder bag. It had to be a backpack. When I rode on the subway, I was thinking about equal weight transfer from both feet, you know, um, and it, I think that that's the gift that we as Pilates teachers can give to our clients is a body awareness when they're sitting in the car at a traffic light. They could be doing deep breathing, working the pelvic floor and the transversus abdominals, exercising to free the neck and the shoulders, you know, um, standing in the grocery store line or at the bank teller, not that most people do it online now, <laughs> but the point being, um, all of the work that we're doing as Pilates teachers, unless it integrates into the consciousness of how we work with our body on an everyday basis, carrying groceries, um, lifting our child out of the car seat, all of those things, have to translate to how we use the body every day. And in the functional aging world, we call it ADLs, activities of daily living. And that's what Mr. Pilates envisioned, was that we're doing this to make ourselves better at everything else that we do. It's brilliant. I love it because that's how I teach as well. I'm like, you don't have to have access to the machines in order to do Pilates. And you just phrased this so brilliantly, like driving the car or picking up groceries. Or lifting your kid, my goodness. How many times a day do we do that with a, an infant or a toddler in and out of the car seat, in and out of the stroller, uh, picking things uh, up uh, from a high shelf and climbing up a stool, getting down. It's interesting because some of the things that we have in the evolution of the Pilates equipment. For example, I'm speaking about the standing platform at the foot of the um, Universal Reformer. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to make it easier so that if you're standing on the Reformer, you don't have to climb down to uh, get to the other side. But Corolla had a whole choreography of how to stand up, climb up one foot, place the other foot, climb back down. As I said, it was like an aerobics class on how you kept your body square and reaching through the crown to the ceiling, climbing up and climbing down. And you had to mount and dismount and walk around to the other side because there was no standing platform. So you were practicing how to climb stairs, getting up and down off the reformer. But now that we have these standing platforms, we don't need that. So we just sort of scuttle ourselves around, you know. But it's funny, isn't it? Some of the things that we think are such great new adjuncts to the original design are actually not helping us with our activities of daily living. Yep, absolutely. What will be your final words before our audience when it comes to Pilates? I think, as you said, to not be discouraged, you know, there was a period when Pilates started to hit the big time, and I have such a perspective because I've been doing it for so long. There was this perception because many of the first generation teachers, and myself included, were dancers, and I have a certain specific body type that people would, quote, aspire to, unquote, but I think that um, Ron Fletcher wrote a wonderful, wonderful book 
every body is beautiful. And I think that um, you're never too old, you're never too overweight, you're never too injured. Um, anybody can do Pilates and start at any time. Uh, our wonderful magazine, Pilates Style, has done such incredible exposés on people who've had depression or amputations or uh, terrible um, setbacks in their lives where Pilates has just saved them. And um, it's something, again, that we can do as long as we're alive. And um, it's, it's a wonderful technique. And I think that, you know, there's a relationship in the body mind to to some other modalities such as tai chi and yoga but that's not for everybody you know westerners which is us we like to move and holding in yoga what we would call a pose is different from integrating good alignment into movement movement and man is an animal that's one of the things that mr pilates said so the more that we can integrate our breath and our movement into that natural animalistic style that you watch a baby a baby animal or a baby there's an exuberance of movement and discovery and i think that we can reignite that in everybody I agree wholeheartedly. Jillian, how can people learn more about you, discover more about you, and buy your book? Well, my book, Pilates Basics, is uh, on my website, which is just www.jillianhessel.com, and it's also available on Amazon, but I will add that... Um, I can inscribe it to you if you order it from me. If you order it from Amazon, it, you won't get that personal inscription. Uh, I'm on Instagram, Jillian Hessel Pilates. I'm on Facebook, Jillian Hessel Pilates. I'm on LinkedIn. And uh, I love to travel. So if there's any teachers of Pilates out there that are interested in having me come for a workshop, I'm very open to that. I'm also beginning to train people via Zoom because not everyone can travel to these conferences and it is expensive. And uh, we're into the age of social media. Zoom is a great, um, well, you're using it. So you're using it right now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So I'm very excited to introduce training via Zoom. I also just want to add, it's a very exciting thing for me. I was invited to Singapore to the first Asia Pilates Summit just this year in March, and I'm invited back next year. And in the interim, my book, Pilates Basics, is being translated into Chinese. How exciting! That's going to be out in 2020. And uh, I'm really excited to access um, the Asian market because, as we know, it, Pilates is a worldwide phenom now. Yeah. And uh, there's lots of folks out there uh, that probably will really gravitate to this work because in Asia, they've always been more into meditation and mind-body connection. That's where yoga and Tai Chi and meditation came from. Yeah. So I'm really excited. Um, to to help people access Pilates. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing this. And we're putting, of course, all the things mentioned in the interview as, as links in our show notes. So you can easily just click and go, get the book, get it inscribed, and take more Pilates. And thank you so much for being here with us today, Jillian. It was a pleasure getting to know you better, and hearing more, of course, about Pilates and the history of Pilates. Thanks again, Heike. And I'll just say I love the name of your podcast, Pursue Your Spark. Oh, thank you. So let's pursue our spark, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Are you ready to start Pilates right now? I hope we motivated and encouraged you to start Pilates. If you live in the LA area, you might as well reach out to Jillian Hessel and see what her studio has to offer for you. But if you happen to be in a very remote part of the world, or you don't have the funds for a private Pilates session, 
you can still practice Pilates by assuming what I call your Pilates body and breathing. It counts as Pilates. Make sure you reach out to Jillian, get a copy of her signed book. All the links are in the show notes for you to easily get to all the things that we've talked about in the show. And next week, I have a solo session here with you guys. And it's part two of the four pillars of transformation in midlife, mindfulness. So my friends, have the most awesome day and I'll see you next week on the show. Ciao.